think it's funny because a lot of people go, health and wellness, college, how does that balance out? Well, obviously, if you're at the IA or BHHS, pretty much the main stressor for our kids and us is college, right? And so hopefully by bringing you some more information, it will alleviate some of your stressors. So that's what we're hoping. Um, the next speaker that we're gonna have after this is Safe Talk, and that is suicide prevention training, and that's gonna be on Monday from 5.30 to 8.30 at BHHS Auditorium, and that is a wonderful, wonderful training. If you guys do have time, um, I went last year, and what I remember is um, Yarden Bloomstein, who is the trainer, said, a lot of people go through CPR, but in their lifetime, we never use it. Is that true? I went through it, and I have not yet used it. He said, out of the people that go to his class, at least one will use the training to help someone, talk someone off the ledge, within three months. Three months. There's that many people out there that if you don't know what the signs are or you don't know how to approach them, you don't. So you could literally save a life by going through this training. So just think about it, Monday, 5.30 to 8.30. All right, that's enough of that. You guys are here to listen to college, and we got two great presenters today, um, Lisa Acton and Alicia Janke, and they are co-owners of Ace College Consultants. And they have been doing this for seven years, but before that, they were at BHHS and IA as college counselors. So they have talked to a ton of colleges and they know what the colleges are looking for. So we are so happy that they agreed to come here and share some of their knowledge with us. Um, I think what they want to do is go through their presentation. If you guys could hold your questions to the end, that would be fabulous. And I did give them all the questions that you guys um, inputted in the Google form. So they do have those already and hopefully the presentation will um, kind of touch upon them. Then. So welcome Lisa and Alicia. All right, thanks Sue. And thank you everybody for coming out tonight. We really, really appreciate it. Um, we know that it, this can be pretty stressful. I mean, uh, my daughter was a senior last year and so even for me, going through the process, I actually said, Alicia, can you handle this for me? Because it's way too much, oh my gosh. Um, but really, knowledge is power, right? And so, uh, and you hear all kinds of crazy things. So we're just here to tell you uh, the real stuff. And um, if you do have questions, please write them down so you don't forget them. And then at the end, uh, we'll definitely have a lot of time to take your questions. And if you can make your questions like as general as possible so that it would, you know, so that it, it kind of uh, will matter for everyone in the room, that would really be great. Okay. Yes. So the first thing I want to talk about are the standardized tests, ACT and SAT. Um, one thing that is relatively new is this whole thing about being test optional, colleges being test optional. And what does that really mean? Um, so actually, you know, the reason that it really started is because of COVID. Um, many of the testing dates and testing centers were canceled. Uh, and so it really was a matter of equity, right? Like uh, every student really didn't have the same opportunities to take the tests as other students. And so what colleges did is they went test optional, meaning if you have a test score, you can send it. If you don't have a test score, you don't have to send it. And so we, we did have to wait like a year or two to kind of see where that all fell. Because prior to that, pretty much every school required either the ACT or the SAT. And by the way, schools think of those tests as being equal. There's no advantage to having an SAT score over an ACT score or vice versa. Okay, so with the test optional though, what we found is that basically 
the admittance rate was about, it seemed to fall roughly around 60% of the students for a test optional college will, will, would have had a test score and 40% would not. We don't know if that's because the majority of the kids sent in a test score or not, okay? So we really don't know that, but this is what we do know. If a student has a test score that corroborates their grade point average, so it, it is um, like equal to it, it supports it, um, then they should send it in. You, you, they should also, you can look at like the school's average test scores for their admitting class and then if, it, if, the, if the score is hitting the average or above, go ahead and submit it. If it's below, just don't submit it. Um, if a student submits an application without a test score, then schools just look kind of more heavily at everything else in the application. Nobody gets into a school because of just their test score, okay? A test score is nothing but, it should, shouldn't be anything but added value to an application. It's just like more support for the student's academic fit for the school, all right? But not everybody's a great test taker. So, you know, actually test optional has really done a, an excellent job of kind of evening out the playing field there, right? So that you don't have to be this amazing standardized test taker, which is a really weird kind of a test that is very artificial and doesn't really measure um, like how successful you're going to be in college anyway. There's no correlation there. Um, the reason that schools like it is because it's another data point, right? It just helps them if they've got a ton of people who are applying. It's just one more thing that they can use. Um, but for those students who just aren't very good test takers, the test optional thing is pretty great, right? And then colleges just, it's just like they just don't have that one extra data point. So they look a little more heavily at all the other aspects in the application, which would be your essays, your letters of recommendation, your activities, et cetera, okay? Um, one thing that I will tell you too, this is relatively new, is that all of the schools, in, all the UC schools, the California schools, they don't even want test scores at all anymore, none. They don't even want them because they just haven't found that it really has much bearing or you know, it doesn't have any sort of predictive success in terms of who's gonna be successful in school. And so it does seem like uh, schools are gonna be staying either test optional or else getting rid of it altogether. There are a couple schools, not a ton anymore, but there are a couple that just absolutely require a test score like MIT. Um, so if you're going to be applying to those schools, then you just have to be able to fit all their data points. Um, let's see what else for tests. Um, which test to take, the ACT or the SAT, and when do you take them? So the ACT and the SAT are very different from one another. They, you actually use different parts of your brain for each test. The ACT is a content-oriented test. The SAT is a reasoning test. So it really just kind of depends on how your brain works, but how, do you, how would your student know which test would be better? A really great way to figure it out is to just Google for a real ACT practice test. So these are ACT tests or SAT tests that were given in the past. Once the test is given, they can't give that test again, so they make it available on the internet for people to practice with, right? So you just Google one of those tests, and this is important, print it off, because we aren't taking the tests on computers yet, so if you try to take the test on the computer, it's gonna give you a different score than if you're taking it on paper, okay? Um, and then have your student take the test, um, and make sure that they're uh, also using the time limits appropriately, and take it all in one sitting, just like a regular test. And then you score it, and you see. If you do it for SAT and ACT, you'll see typically most people do much better on one than on the other. For me, the ACT is a lot easier. I don't know why, but it just is. Um, I will say that there's a lot more math on the SAT. The SAT score is half math. Um, and for the ACT, it's only a quarter math. The ACT goes a little bit higher in math, but it, there's only a couple of math questions that are, are a little bit higher. and so. Overall, I think the ACT is better for students who aren't super strong in math, or math isn't really their thing. Um, the reading portion on the SAT tends to be uh, 
Well, with the SAT, a lot of times they use really old kind of classic um, um, uh, selections. So the fiction section will probably be from, you know, like 1820 from some some politician in a cornfield in Iowa giving a speech or something, and that can be very challenging for some kids. Um, other kids, not a problem. So you know, there's there are there are definite differences between the two tests. Just take the practice tests and then see which one is better suited for you. So Michigan now is an SAT uh, SAT state. So automatically, your student their junior year is going to be taking the SAT, whether they want to or not. They've got to do it, right? Um, if your student also wants to take the ACT, all you have to do is just go online to act.org and sign up for the tests. Um, so when do you sign up for the tests? Like when do you take those tests? Um, you, you want to be, oh, I don't want to cover that up. You want to be careful um, that you don't take them too early. If you take them really early, you're going to get an artificially low score. So those tests were designed to be taken in the spring of your junior year, okay? So if you take them in your sophomore year, just think of all, just the math that, that you don't know by that time. So your score is gonna be artificially low. Even if you take it the first semester of your junior year, it's gonna be artificially low, but you'll still get a really good idea. Personally, I think that the best time to take the tests um, officially, like for real, would be in December of your junior year. Um, you can take an SAT, you can take an ACT. And then, you know, you've got the experience of actually taking the test, of, you know, going into that room and going through the whole process. And then you also have your score, which you can get score reports from either the SAT or the ACT that really break it down for you. Um, which questions did you miss and why did you miss them? What is it that this way you can really focus your study, which is another thing I want to mention. Um, some people take really, really, really intensive and long and expensive test prep courses. Honestly, they really aren't necessary. Um, your grades are so much more important than your test score, no matter what, even for schools that require a test score. It's really the grades, the GPA, is the number one thing that they look at. Number two is the rigor of the curriculum. So how difficult are the classes that you're taking? Like all 4.0s aren't, aren't equal, really, if you look at what courses you've taken during, during your high school career. So they look to see, are you challenging yourself? You know, are you taking difficult classes? Um, that's number two. And then the third thing, and it's a distant third in terms of a number data point, is the standardized test score. So like a really super intensive, long um, test prep, oftentimes, affects a student's GPA. They're so focused on prepping for this test that they're not doing their best in school. It, that's just a really big mistake. Like, school is number one. Your classes are the most important thing out of everything. And so, you know, for test prep, you just don't need a really super long, intensive course. Um, particularly if you're going to a school like International Academy, you know, it doesn't get any more rigorous than here. You're, you're taking advanced classes in every single academic area, and all the classes, except for math, uh, all the classes are taught at the higher level, even if the student doesn't end up testing at the higher level. They're all taught at the higher level. So by the time you take these tests, spring of your junior year, your student is likely, in terms of curriculum, they are ready, they are totally ready. What you want to practice then would be the test taking strategies. There's a way to take an ACT and there's a way to take an SAT. You can find all the information online. It's really not that difficult. You could work with a private tutor. Um, you could take a class if you want to, or you could just get those. They have these really big, thick books that you can get right off of Amazon, uh, full of practice tests. Just make sure that it says real ACT tests or real SAT tests. Um, because otherwise, you know, some companies like Kaplan or O'Malley, like they, they approximate the tests. They have, you know, they have their own test creators, but they're not actual tests from those companies. And you want to practice using the actual tests from those companies. But in those big thick books with the real tests in them, they also have all the information on strategies on how to approach it and how to, how to take the test so that you get your highest score. It's really kind of a game. 
Um, and a lot of it is just practicing also. You know, it's like if you're going to play a video game, the first time you play it, you really kind of stink at it, right? You don't know what you're doing. But the more you play it and the more you understand it and the more you know the strategies, the better you get. It's exactly the same with the SAT and the ACT. Okay? So um, when to really start studying, I would say the summer after your sophomore year and get one of those big books and then just kind of start working your way through it, um, looking at the strategy part of it and also knowing that most of the questions that you're going to miss will be things that you just haven't learned yet because it's the summer <laughs> before junior year where you're going to learn those things. Okay? Um, so I think that's about it for the SAT and ACT, but now I'm afraid to change the slide because <laughs> I don't want to go too far. The down button. Yeah, yeah, I did it. Okay. All right. The science portion of the ACT? Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, Alicia was just reminding me. One of the differences also between the SAT and the ACT is that the ACT has a science, a dedicated science portion. So the ACT has math and it has reading and then it has English grammar and then it's got a science portion. Um, the science portion, honestly, you guys, is not about science. It's really another reading test. Um, it's a reading test and can you, can you decipher charts and graphs, basically. So again, if you get one of those books, then it has all the information in it. You do get the same kind of science stuff in the SAT, but they just put it in their reading portion, okay? So the ACT has those four distinct areas. The SAT, half of it is math, and then the other half, they call it, uh, I think they call it writing and language maybe, but it's the English grammar, which is, by the way, is exactly the same as ACTs. They're like almost exactly the same. And then the reading portion is longer than on the ACT and they include the science stuff in it. So some of the sections will be sciency. Okay? All right. So now let's talk about besides test scores, what other factors do uh, colleges consider? So like I said, the academic data points that the colleges look at. Number one is your grade point average. That's just the number one thing. It, what you've done over, you know, three years is so much more important than what you did in a three-hour test, okay? In colleges, you know, it is kind of strange when you think about it. You apply to college at the beginning of your senior year. You haven't even gotten grades for senior year yet. So colleges, if you get an acceptance, they're accepting you based on what you've done so far with the expectation that you're going to perform similarly um, your senior year. So just because you get into college, like first semester of your senior year doesn't mean woohoo, now I can, you know, do whatever I want. And it doesn't matter what grades I get because it definitely still does matter what kind of grades you get. The colleges are all sent grade reports at the end of your senior year. So those grades definitely count. And if you don't live up to the expectations, then they rescind their offer of acceptance. Okay? So besides those academic data points, you have these, all these other things that are included in the application. Most students will use the common application for the majority of their schools. So many schools now participate in the common application. It's pretty much almost, you know, a lot of students will be able to just use the common app and that's it. With the common app, the advantage is that the initial portion, the common portion, is just data, like, you know, where you live, um, uh, you know, information about parents' educational background, stuff like that. Um, so, but the, the nice thing is you only have to type that stuff in once, and then you're done with it. And then you have supplements for every college that you apply to, okay? Um, within the uh, college application, they're going to ask you about um, your activities and your, the honors that you have uh, garnered, academic honors, if you've, if you've got any. So, um, there really aren't any activities that are better than others. There really aren't. Um, the thing that's better is, is your student super interested in that activity? Like, do, is it organic, right? Like, do they love it? Do they really love it? Do they have passion within it? 
Um, depth of involvement is so much more important than the number of things that you're involved in, okay? Colleges love to see longevity. They like to see that you've, you're involved in something and you've, you've stuck with it, um, you know, through high school. You can be involved in just two things, but if you have great depth of involvement, then that's awesome. No college is looking for an all-around, well-rounded kid. Like, you don't have to have a sport, and you don't have to play music, and you don't have to, you know, like you don't have to do all those things, not at all. Um, you know, it's just like everybody thinks, well, I need to have, I need to have leadership. Like, I need, to have, I need to have an office, you know, like a, a title in my activities. No, you don't. No, you don't. First of all, <laughs> who wants to go to a college where every single student is a leader? I mean, that would be awful, <laughs> wouldn't it? You got to have some great team players too, right? And the other thing is, is that there are so many ways that you can show leadership skills without being the president or, you know, the founder or whatever. Um, you know, just in terms of you know, little things that you help to organize or that you help run or things that you do in class. There are so many ways that you can show what kind of a leader you are when you need to be a leader. But it's also really important to, to uh, talk about how you are also like an excellent team player too, okay? So with the activities, don't get to, you know, don't get like, oh, I have to have so many things. No, you don't. You really don't. You have to have a couple. Um, just because colleges don't, you know, they're looking to see, are you going to be involved when you're in college? They really don't particularly want kids who just go to class and then come back to their dorm and then go to class and come back to their dorm. They want people who are involved, right? Um, so with the activities and things like that, they're looking to see, are you involved in your community? And if so, how? And what things are you really passionate about? Okay? Um, letters of recommendation are another thing that they look at. So the letters of recommendation come from teachers uh, for the most part. Schools that require letters typically only require one. Some of the more competitive schools will require two. Um, and then some people, you know, some students who maybe are really super involved in something outside of school, you could have a coach write a letter or something like that, okay? Um, the best way to go about the letter of recommendation thing is to really encourage your students to get to know their teachers, um, to have conversations with them. Uh, before class, just talk to them in the hallways uh, to, to make sure that they raise their hand and ask a question at least once every class, right? Um, not everybody is an extrovert and super outgoing, and that's fine. There is absolutely nothing at all wrong with being an introvert, nothing. Um, but uh, you do need to make sure that you're making an effort to communicate with your teachers. And the more that the teachers get to know you, the better of a letter that they can write for you. Same thing with your counselor, by the way. Like, really, really encourage your students to go talk to their counselor, get to know them. Um, so a teacher's letter addresses the student's um, abilities and promise in that particular academic area, okay? The teacher really doesn't talk about clubs you're in or things like that unless maybe they, they're the sponsor of that club, right? Um, the counselor letter is the one that really kind of brings it all together. And the counselor letter talks about everything about the student, the clubs, the, the activities, you know, how they are as a citizen of their school, basically. And so as important as it is to get to know teachers so that you've got a lot to choose from to ask for a letter of recommendation, um, it's also vitally important to get to know your high school counselor as well, okay? And as far as the procedure for asking for a letter of recommendation, you know, every school is different. So you just have to pay attention to the policy of the school. Um, I believe at International Academy, uh, they prefer students to wait until the beginning of their senior year to ask teachers for a letter. And the reason for that is that you may have a teacher senior year that you had freshman year that, that is fantastic, would write a great letter for you, but you don't know that until you actually start school your senior year. Most people really kind of believe, well, I, I need to ask a junior year teacher because college is obviously, if, if a teacher's gonna write about your academic promise, you want somebody who, who you've had as a teacher relatively recently, either as, in junior year or in senior year, okay? So definitely, especially junior year, make sure you're getting to know your teachers really well. 
It's be even better though if you start prior to that and really make an effort freshman and sophomore year because then a teacher can write about the growth that they've seen in you over the years. And those make really great letters. And then the final one are the essays. So, <laughs> you know, there's a great, great resource and it's free. And it, it's available to everybody at any time. And it's, it's the college essay guy, the college essay guy. This guy is fantastic. Both Alicia and I have met him. He's, fa he, he, he's like, he's just the best. You find a lot of, um, you know, advice on the internet uh, in terms of how to, how to write your essays. The college essay guy is absolutely, he knows exactly what he's talking about. He's the best. And he's got everything. I mean, he's got how to structure these essays, how to find your voice, um, examples, examples even for almost every school. I mean, it's crazy how much stuff he has. Um, and so take advantage of that. Utilize that because it, it, it's golden, you guys. I'm telling you. Um, the essays are just a fantastic way to stand out from the crowd. It's a weird way to write. Um, it's, you, you're writing first person narrative. Like how often do you do that in school? You don't, you never do that in school. And you're also supposed to brag about yourself. Something else we tell you don't, you know, you shouldn't do that. So it's a weird thing to do. And so people struggle with it. And typically student essays all kind of turn out the same. They're pretty vague. Um, they use a lot of big words that they, you know, found in the thesaurus. Um, or they could be like really over edited. Let me tell you something. They don't care what a 55 year old woman thinks at all. They want to know what a 17 year old young man thinks and they can tell the difference. Okay. So you really have to be careful that those essays are not over edited. Um, and that they just like, you know, they really ring true for the student. Um, so Anyway, if you look at the college essay guy, you will see just it, it is basically every piece of information, every piece of advice that you could want or that you could need, okay? All right, let me see what else. Uh, that's really, I think, about it for that. So going back to the whole test optional thing, right? If you send in a test score, then that's added value and that's another data point that they're looking at. If you don't have a test score, they're just looking at everything else in the application a little bit more heavily. Yeah. The college essay guy. Mm -hmm. Guy, G-U-Y. Yes. He's got a great book out, um, but honestly, his website is fantastic, and it's got all the latest, most up-to-date information. And he's got videos. He's got boot camps. I mean, he's, he's, it's fabulous, and it's free. Um, because he makes his money other ways, <laughs> so. Right? Okay, so now Alicia's going to tell you about some other really exciting stuff. Okay, thank you. Um, I, as Sue mentioned, she gave us uh, questions that you have submitted, and so um, we're trying to make sure we cover some of those things. And one of the questions um, that was submitted was how to conduct college search when you don't know what major? Um, it was a really excellent question <clears throat> because, you know, one of the things, first things we do um, is say to the student, so what do you want to major in? What do you want to be? What do you want to do? And oftentimes they have no idea. And when you look at the statistics, you know, I have a hard time seeing it from there, so I'm just going to use this. Um, when you look at some of the statistics, about 80% of the students change their major in the first year. And about, on the average, the students change their major about three times. I know about Lisa and I were talking before um, the presentation that both of us started out thinking we wanted to do something different. So it is absolutely fine if your student doesn't know what they want to do. Of course, it helps in narrowing down the college list if, if you have an idea of what you want to study because certain schools have um, programs that may be stronger in certain areas, and so you want to look at those colleges. 
when, when you look about uh, the, the fact that colleges are all about exploration, and basically if you look at all the colleges you know, that, that we have at our disposal, they all have great programs. Um, so it's okay if you don't know what it is that you want to major in. Now, there are certain majors where it is important that you um, come in knowing what you want to do. And for example, engineering is one of them. Um, it's because it's, once, it's easier to get into the program than it is transferring into. Um, and for, in many colleges, that's a difficult thing to do if you want to transfer into engineering after your first year or so. Um, but also within that, the statistics are that about 40 to 50 percent of the students, engineering students, either drop out or change majors within their first year. A lot of them find out, for example, that the math is a lot harder than what they thought, um, you know, or it's not what they thought it was going to be. So be aware that it's okay if they don't know what major they want to go into. Now, one thing that um, IA has that I think you should take advantage of is um, an assessment called U, U Science. Is it done in um, sophomore year? I think it's in the sophomore year that the students take it. And um, it's an online um, assessment. Doesn't take a long time. But what happens is once the, the students take it, if you ask them to let you go on their website, um, in the right top, top right corner, there's something called download report or something like that. And what you'll get is something like this. And it's pretty thick. It's got you know a lot of information. And the whole idea behind this U Science assessment is the intersection of interest and abilities and skills. And you know, when you really think about yourself and you think about your careers and you think about where you have been the most successful or the, the happiest, the most content, it's usually when you find a career or a job where takes advantage of all your skills, uses all your skills, but it also is where your interests are the highest. So the whole idea behind the U-Science is to show students that uh, combination. And so they talk about things like uh, you know, goal setting. Um, they talk about um, how you process information, things like that. But what I like the best about it, and I'm gonna try to do this while I'm holding this, um, is they, they do have a career section. And the student can go and based on how they answer the questions, they can go look in that section and they can, um, they're given a list of careers or a, career, or a list of jobs that, um, you know, would be good for them. Now, I find that oftentimes the students will say, well, I don't wanna be a manager or I don't wanna be that. So what I tell them is don't look at the specific title of the job. But look at a pattern. When you look at the job jobs that are recommended for you, are they talking about STEM-oriented areas? Are they talking about service-oriented areas? Are they talking? What are they? You know, what, what kind of a field? What kind of a pattern are you seeing? And that's what you should be looking at. And then um, at one point they have this uh, one area. I know you can't see it, but. This one little dark area here. And what it says is this, your aptitudes alone aren't the whole story. So find that sweet spot where your aptitudes and your interests match up. And then they say, we discovered that your top interests, and this is a student's, I blocked their name out, but this is a student's report that I took. Um, your top interests are, for this particular student, investigative work that's intellectual and theoretical in nature artistic work that is creative and original, and social work that is helping and supportive. And it really does describe the student quite well. Um, you know, the interest, she's very much into research, um, some of that STEM. Um, she's also very creative. And she also is very socially conscious of wanting to do good, wanting to do something for the benefit of others. So. 
this really described her. So now when you're talking about what, what career you want to choose, we're not talking about you have to go into this area, but look at what areas fulfill these three, case, these three items. What careers could give you that um, um, opportunity to do research, to be investigative, but also allow you to be creative, and also allow you to do something for the greater good. So now, hopefully, as she's looking at her career, that's her context. Instead of, I want to become this, or I want to go into this area. So the youth science is a very um, helpful tool. Students have it here. Take advantage of them. Ask them to see a copy. And there's a ton of information on the website, but if you want a compact uh, you know, information, this report is very, very helpful. Okay. Oh, you're gonna help me with that? Okay. So the next question that came up, um, or some of the other questions that came up uh, were about the college list. And that's, you know, one of the biggies, right? How do I come up with a college list? How do I know where to apply? So a couple ideas um, to help out with the college list. What I recommend is that you create a framework that works for you. And for every one of you, that framework may be different. But come up with some items that are important to, to you, to your student, to your family. And it can be things like location, believe it or not. Um, are you comfortable if you, your son or daughter goes any place in the country? Or some families say, you know, we really want them within maybe six to eight hours drive from home. Or maybe we want them in state. So that narrows the list down automatically. If you say, no, we're looking at this area, or we need it to be this far or this close to home. So take a look at the location. Size. Um, for some students, large universities are fantastic. They do extremely well. For other students, a smaller university or a college would be a lot, lot better. For some students sitting in a, in a lecture hall of 400 students, um, you know, they, they will be successful. They, they will navigate that. For other students, being in a, a lecture hall of 400 kids, they will not go and ask for help. They will not know where to go or may be shy about it, whatever the case may be, they would be a lot better if they were in a classroom filled with 20 students. So size is, an issue, you know, is a factor. Uh, you should definitely take a look at it and see which would be better for your student. Um, you know, then there are academic factors. Um, if you know your major, if you don't and you want to explore, whatever the case, there are social factors. Uh, we've had students who say, you know, any college as long as um, the Greek system is very active. I want to be in a fraternity or I want to be in a sorority. Um, or um, I want to be one where there's a lot of sports. You know, I want to go to the big football games. I, I don't want to go to a small college because there's just not much going on over there. Um, and of course, area of study, like I said, for some students is being able to explore. For other students, they know exactly what they want to do. The last item, oh, it's not coming through on here. Okay, the last item is big name school versus best fit schools. What, you know, this is an area that, I guess I'm just blunt with, with, with uh, the, the families that we work with, and asking them, please define what good school means to you. Because invariably, every parent, every student says to me, I want to go to a good school. What do you mean by good school? And more often than not, good school means big name school. And the reality is that in this country, we are very fortunate to have many, many, many really good institutions of learning. And it's not just those big names that we are all familiar with, but there are a lot of other places as well. 
And so, you know, one of the, the things that I think is important is to be honest with yourself and to say, what do I mean by a good school? Because I think it is more important, we both feel that it's more important that you talk about a fit, a good fit for your student, rather than the big name. So, you know, so just some of the factors um, as you're um, creating that college list. Now I'm gonna do something that I, we both are not crazy about, but I, I will share this with you. And that is the infamous, right? U.S. News and World Report and the rankings. This is two years old, by the way. Um, I don't think I've even seen one recently in hard copy. But anyway, we do not recommend that you look at the rankings. Okay, please do not look at the rankings. Um, maybe you have heard just recently that Columbia, which was like the top couple, I forget what they were, but they were <coughs> they were pretty high up, excuse me. Um, they fell down to like number 18, oh heavens forbid. Um, but what happened is because the school didn't submit some information. <sighs> Does that mean that Columbia has really fallen down in quality? No, okay. So be very, very cautious. But the reason I bring this up, I'm gonna try to do this one-handed here. Okay, this is gonna be. <laughs> Hang on just a second. One of the sections that they have is when you look, oh, where is this? Oh, for Pete's sake. Here we go, oh, here we go, okay. For example, they have you know, the best national universities, and there's a list, right? If you remember seeing these, there's the list, right? And of course, it starts with Princeton, or Harvard, and Columbia, so on and so forth. But as you keep turning the pages, there's number 100, 10, there's number 120 or so, or 220, I should say. So what you may want to do, the only way that I would recommend that you use this is not for the rankings, but for the names. If, if you don't know what colleges are out there, take a look at this. They also have best um, liberal arts schools, right? Again, don't look at the rankings, but look at the names so that then you can go and check those places out and become familiar with the, what's out there. We all know the Harvards and the Princeton and the Yales and so on and so forth. But there are, you know, DePaul University in Indiana, DePaul University in Chicago, for example. Uh, there are just a lot of places all over the whole country. So that's, I, I bring this up just to give you a resource to how do I find out about schools. That's the only time you'll ever see me pull this out. <laughs> okay, so now how do you narrow the list down? We recommend that, while well, you may start out with 20 schools, 30 schools initially, um, you really want to narrow it down to about 10 schools. And the reason for that is depending on the school, obviously, but many of them require the students to write so many essays. On the average, what, well, Lisa, three? Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, on average, a school will have three or four essays. That, that doesn't include the main essay, which is your common app essay, your personal statement essay. So the supplemental part, you know, the, the supplement that's college specific will have another three, maybe four. Some have 10, 15. Um, some are, like you think it's easy, it's just finish this sentence, but sometimes the ones that are like smaller are even more, you know, of a mind bender. How can I describe in 50 words how I'm going to save the world, you know, or whatever. So, so you got to keep that in mind. And also remember that the student is still doing senior year. Like they still have other classes. They still have all these other things that they have to do uh, in addition. So, uh, you know, my daughter applied to three schools. That was it, just three. So you don't have to do 10. 10 is like maximum, maximum. 
University of Chicago has some bizarre questions, uh, prompts. Uh, where's, uh, yeah, there's, there's just really, so truly, you know, when we think about stress level and what we expect of our students, uh, we tell them, maintain your grades, right? Maintain your involvement in activities. Maybe they work. Um, but do the best in school. Get the best grades. But then on top of it, oh, by the way, you're going to write 30 essays. And you can't start too early because as of August 1, um, that's when colleges confirm what the requirements are. And some even go a little bit later into August. So you really can't start too early. And especially for the AA students, you, you know, you guys start school in the middle of August, right? Um, so there isn't that much time. So do think about the stress that we are putting on the students. And, you know, in my opinion, if you start going more than 10, it's more like a shotgun approach. And in colleges, it does not work it, in terms of like if, you know, it's not a, like a, a raffle where you, if I put more card name, name cards in, in, in the box, I have a greater chance of having my name pulled out, right? It doesn't work in colleges. So just because you've applied to more colleges doesn't mean that you have better chance of getting in. Um, instead, if you have a thoughtful approach to the colleges, then you increase your chances of getting in. So speaking of that, Oops, Thank you. come on partner. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the things in creating a college list is that we want it to be balanced. And by balance, I'm talking about the acceptance rate. So you want to make sure that you have a safety school. Safety school, you'll see the numbers are different Based, you know, different people may have slightly different numbers, but roughly, safety school is the one that has a 70% or higher acceptance rate. So, for example, in our area, MSU would be a safety school, right? It's about 71% or so. Um, you should have at least one, maybe two. Um, but what I also tell the students is make sure that it's a school that if the worst scenario happen, if you didn't get accepted any place, and the only place was that safety school, that you would love it, that you, that's the place you would like to spend the next four years in. So don't just put it there because, you know, oh man, she's asking me to put a safety school, so I'm just gonna put this down. But safety school should be just as thoughtful as any other place. The bulk of your college list should be in the target area. And the target area is roughly the 30 to 70% acceptance rate. So you should have about you know, four, five maybe colleges within that target area. That's your greatest chance of being accepted. And then I used to just put reach schools and then I decided to start breaking it down even more. Reach schools being the ones that have uh, between 15 and 30 percent, and then dream schools, which is the one that are below 15 percent acceptance rate. And you know, go ahead and dream. By all means, go ahead. If, if you want to go to Columbia, by all means, apply. But don't make um, your college list 80 percent of these dream schools, uh, reach schools, because there's a very good chance you may not get into any of them. And we haven't had that happen to us, and I don't think we'll ever let it happen. But I have heard from other consultants that they are getting students in um, April going, I didn't get accepted into any school. What do I do now? Well, when you look at the college list or the list of where they have applied for, they were all schools within that dream uh, and reach category. So balance your list. Go ahead and dream. Go ahead and see what happens. But make sure that your bulk of schools is in the target area and make sure you have at least one safety school. Okay. Um, so the last area is you know, the million dollar question, how do I pay for this? <laughs> right, I wish I had an answer for you. <laughs> um, 
you know, the, the college cost has just been going up and up and up. I don't think it's going to slow down any. And it is, um, it is crazy. So one of the things that I would recommend is that you have an honest family conversation and forget FAFSA, forget you know what they tell you how much you can afford, but you need to sit down with your son or daughter and say, this is what we can afford. And then you need to discuss how much are you willing your son or daughter, uh, how much debt are you willing to have your daughter or son graduate with? And how much debt are you willing, additional debt, are you willing to take on? You know, applying to Princeton, Yale, Columbia, and all those stuff is wonderful. It's fantastic, right? You're talking seventy-five dollars to $80,000. And the Ivies, and there was one of the questions, the Ivies do not give merit award is strictly need-based. So is it worth for you to go into debt in order to go to that school? If the answer is yes, then that's fine. But you know up front what you're getting into. Um, and, and you can then adjust your finances accordingly and so on and so forth. But that's a conversation that really should happen at the very, very beginning of the process. How much can we truly afford for school? How much debt are we willing to take on? How much debt do we want our son or daughter to graduate with? Do we want them to graduate with $5,000 debt? Do we want them to graduate with a $60,000 debt? And that also determines what schools you're going to be looking at. Because if the, if the answer is, you know what, this is what we can afford. We can only afford $40,000 a year. Then you should be looking at schools that are within that range or ones that, where you can get more financial aid, more scholarships, actually. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But I think that's an important conversation to have. So having said that, um, there are a couple things to keep in mind as you're trying to figure out how am I going to pay for this. One of the things is that you need to be um, aware of that you, when you see the price tag, when you see a school costing $75,000, they're talking about the total cost of attendance, COA, often uh, times referred to. And what the total cost of attendance includes is tuition, its room and board, fees, and there are a lot of fees, um, books, uh, supplies, uh, personal expenses that your son or daughter will need, uh, you know, the, the allowance, so to speak. Um, they even include, oftentimes, transportation. Because if your son or daughter ends up going to the, east, to the West Coast, for example, or ends up going to Boston, how often are you going to bring them home? How often are you going to go visit them? Airline tickets are not cheap, right? So how much money are you going to be spending on the transportation portion? That's all part of the total cost of attendance. So just be aware as you're looking at that price, what that includes. The second thing is um, the expected family contribution. So let's talk a little bit about FAFSA. Um, I think everyone is pretty much familiar with FAFSA, the, the, the free um, application for federal student aid. In order to get any kind of financial aid, you need to fill out FAFSA. And the FAFSA, you can start filling it out as of October 1, a senior year. Um, a simplistic explanation for FAFSA, by the way, um, so do you know when this is the financial aid night? Uh, oh, it already happened. Ooh, I hope you guys went to it. Um, if not, go to it next year if, if you're a junior. Um, it, right, you only want to go to financial aid night the year that your student is a senior, because the information changes from year to year, so 
Um, but, but definitely the one that they have here is excellent. Um, Carrie Gilchrist comes from Oakland University and she does a great job of explaining the FAFSA and what you need to do and she makes it pretty simple. So it's not, it's not as hard as it used to be. I have a son who went to college 10 years ago and then my daughter who just went to college and you know, now the FAFSA just pulls from your previous um, income tax. If you e-filed, then it's really easy. So if, when you fill out the FAFSA, um, the, the, the simple explanation is based on your income, based on your um, you know, taxes and other information, assets, so on and so forth, they're going to tell you how much you're expected to contribute. So let's say that based on your income and, and everything else, um, FEFSA tells you that you will contribute, you can contribute $35,000. If you apply to a college that costs $35,000 or less, you don't qualify for any financial aid. If you apply to a college that costs more, then you qualify for that difference. So let's say you apply to a college that costs $75,000 a year. You would then qualify for $40,000 in financial aid. Sounds great, except the university is the one that determines if you're going to get any aid, even though you qualify, and how much. And some are more generous, some are less generous. So in some cases, it may be just, um, let's say $5,000 in work study and maybe $10,000 in loans, even though the discrepancy is $40,000, okay? Um, so, so, you know, um, be aware of that family contribution aspect. Now, starting next year, they're changing the term um, expected family contribution to student aid index. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not quite sure I understand the difference between the two. Uh, they say it's going to be more accurate. Um, I don't know. That's something that talking to a financial aid person from a university uh, will be very helpful. Um, the other thing for you to be aware of is the difference between need-based and merit-based. Need-based, as it indicates, is the student's financial need. Most colleges offer need-based aid of some sort. The, one of the criteria, however, is the, the, the family's income. So they may say, yes, we provide 100% of the student's need, um, but if that family income is, and I'm making a number up, is $60,000 a year. If it's more than that, then you wouldn't qualify. Um, merit-based is uh, uh, merit. It's, it's scholarships. It's based on a student's academic achievement, athle uh, athletic, uh, you know, um, artistic, what have you. It has nothing to do with income. It's strictly based on the student's um, achievement. And the thing is that, again, um, it, it's up to the university to determine who gets it. And so um, you have to be careful or you have to find out, do I have to apply for this merit aid? Or is the student automatically considered for this merit aid? Um, you know, get all the information you can. And oftentimes merit-based is also uh, based on um, GPA. Some colleges, and I, I think Grand Valley is still doing that, if I'm not mistaken. I know Institute, um, Illinois Institute of Technology is a great place if you're into STEM, um, would offer X amount of dollars based on your GPA. So let's say, and again, I'm making up the number, but let's say you had a, your student had a 3.6, they would give you $1,000. If they had a 3.7, they would give you $2,000, so on and so forth. Um, so check that out. Um, as an IB diploma student, there are a number of schools that offer, um, and, and more often, uh, it's, it's more in credit than it is in money. But for example, Elma College, which is just 
north of Lansing, um, offers what up to 32 credits, I think I believe, up to uh, around 32 credits. That's like a year's worth of, you know, you're starting up as a junior, as a sophomore rather. Um, because uh, you simply had the IB diploma. So there are schools that also offer that portion. Um, so, you know, how do you, how do you find out all of these things? Um, as Lisa mentioned at the beginning, knowledge is power, right? So one of the things, well, there's not an easy question of how to pay for it, but one of the things that you can do, and I would strongly recommend, is take this time, especially if you have a junior um, or a sophomore, and spend a little bit of time learning about financial aid. Go on the FAFSA website and just learn the lingo. You know, um, what is a subsidized loan versus an unsubsidized loan, so on and so forth. So just spend a little bit of time and become familiar with that website and the information on that website. Um, there's uh, FAFSA Forecaster is, is another, uh, if you just type in FAFSA for the number four, Caster, um, you can put an estimated, um, get an estimated idea of, of how much you may get from, from them. Um, but just learning about that whole financial aid field will be very helpful to you. The next step that I would recommend is look at the individual college's financial aid website. There is a ton of information on those websites. And it doesn't matter at this point which college you put in, you know, put a variety of colleges. Um, but they also, they tell you about scholarships. They will tell you, do you have to fill, uh, fill um, submit an additional application? Do you have to write an additional essay? Um, or are you automatically considered for those? Are those renewable every year or not? They also indicate if, you, if they have scholarships that are available to students who already are at that university so that you know that maybe the freshman year you don't get as much money, but then the um, uh, sophomore year and onward you have more opportunities to get more scholarships uh, and more aid for your, for your son or daughter. Um, are those renewable? Do you have to apply every year? Or is that for the next four years? So at this point, you know, getting as much information as you possibly can help will help you a little bit in, in finding ways of, of, you know, how do you pay for this. In terms of scholarships, your best chances are local scholarships. So if you can find you know, the Lions Club, the Optimist Club, um, anything else that may um, be in the area or in your community, um, some um, workplaces offer some scholarships. That's yours. Uh, there aren't that many of them, but, but I know that they, there are some. Um, but looking around locally, then you can go on, um, on the internet, and you can put um, fast web, right? Yes. Yes. Fast web, F A S T W E B. Um, they have ton, 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 ton of scholarships. And what you do is you put a profile in there. So they have things like, you know, for six foot left handed people, <laughs> there are scholarships, and there's some bizarre ones. Um, but, and, and they update that for the student. So once you put that in, you can um, keep getting new ones. Yes? Fast, F-A-S-T, web, W-E-B, one word. Um, the thing is, don't ever pay for a scholarship search. If anyone says, hey, I'll find you a bunch of scholarships, but it's going to cost you this much money, it's a scam. Don't do that. Uh, there's a lot of information that you can um, gather yourself. So anyway, um, I hope that that helps a little bit. And what I would like to end with is um, another resource that I think is very helpful, especially for those of you who have dreams of going to those very selective schools. Um, there is um, an author, Jeffrey Salingo, perhaps some of you are familiar with him. He's a uh, uh, a journalist, but he has basically written 
Uh, most of his writings have to do with higher education. He's written several books, but the one that I really like the best is this one, Who Gets In and Why. He spent a year working, uh, being with about four or five colleges, um, and just going through the whole process from beginning to end. And he really gives you information about how the, the inner workings of the admission world. So this is very, very helpful. And one of the things that he says is ultimately it's not about is this a great student, but what does a great class look like? And that applies to both the admission and that applies both to the financial aid. Uh, from the college's perspective, they may look at a student, excuse me, they may look at a student and say, this is a great kid, but what they're concerned with is the kind of a class that they bring in every year. And so it is possible that a student who's not as academically uh, advanced as your son or daughter gets into a place, um, but you know what? They were looking for a tuba player. He plays the tuba, and it came down to it, and that's who they picked. And I wouldn't believe that, except a number of years ago, I was at um, John Hopkins. They put on a, um, a workshop for counselors, and they actually gave us, uh, I don't know, four or five uh, applications, real applications, black out the names and pertinent information but real applications, and they said we had one spot. This is a real situation for them. We had one spot left. Who do you think we picked out of this bunch? You know, us counselors, we all went, well, this kid has this great GPA, so I bet you, you they went with this. Or this kid's resume, look at the resume. He's been involved in this and this, and then he's president of this. Turned out it was a tennis player whose GPA was good. It wasn't bad. GPA was good, but it wasn't as good as some of the other students, okay? So I'm not saying this to depress you. <laughs> that, that's not my intent. But my intent is to help you understand the process and to understand that it is very complicated. It's complicated for the universities. Uh, it's not easy. If you talk to the admission people, they will admit to you that it's not easy for them either because their goal, truly, truly, and I, I believe this truly, is not to um, eliminate kids. They would love to get as many of the students in as possible, but there are only so many spots. And they have to make decisions on who they take. And ultimately, their goal is creating a great class. So I would recommend that, you know, take a, if you have a little bit of time, take a look at this book. Um, I think you'll find it very, very helpful. Speaking of which, um, we appreciate you giving us this opportunity. We hope that the information was helpful to you, and we would like to open this up now to any questions. questions. Yes. Um, actually, before we do that, I just want a couple things that I wrote down that I wanted to make sure that I mentioned. Um, like Alicia, I mean, I, I was at Vanderbilt and um, working with their admissions people. And basically, what we came away with is that sometimes it just depends on, is your admissions person having a good day, right? Did they spill coffee on themselves on the way in? Then they look at the application and go, no. Or, or did they fall in love the night before? And then they're like, oh, this is the best, right? So the whole thing is, you really have to keep that uh, in perspective so that you don't define yourself based on your acceptances or denials from schools because it has nothing to do with if you're a great student and a great person, et cetera. Um, it's really kind of arbitrary when it comes to the highly competitive schools, okay? Um, a couple other things I just wanna mention really quick. Super important to do campus visits if you can. That is like the best way to determine if a school's a great fit for you. For most people, as soon as you walk onto a college campus, you're like, oh my God, I love this, I feel at home here, this would be great for me, or no, this is weird. And even the, the ones where you go and you're like, I hate this school, that is such useful information, because then you know what you don't want, right? So I just wanted to mention that. And also, 
Remember that most people only know their state schools and then the big names, the ones that have all the PR money or for sports. But there are thousands and thousands and thousands of schools in the United States, not to mention internationally, that are fantastic. So, you know, keep an open mind. Just because you haven't heard of a school doesn't mean it's no good. In fact, there are schools that are ranked, like, you know, or thought of even more highly in the academic world than the big name schools. So, keep an open mind with that. One and of the, uh, if I can interrupt, one of the great, really good engineering schools is called Harvey Mudd in uh, California. Yeah, California. And the first time I heard that, I said, oh, what the heck? What's a Harvey Mudd? It's a great school for engineering. Very tiny, very small, but it's not one that you know, people know. Has the highest level of student happiness of any college, right? Yeah. Or like Alicia mentioned, even in your state, Alma College, if you have an IB diploma, you get 32 credits right off the bat. You could do your college in three years. And Alma is the second biggest feeder school to Harvard Law, only behind Harvard. So keep an open mind with that kind of stuff. And one other thing really quick before I open up to questions is credit unions and banks, they have great scholarships typically, scholarship opportunities for college. So check where you bank too for that. Okay, so questions, Lisa, yes. Hi. Can a coach or like a, a teacher that your child has had since age three write a letter of recommendations? If the school accepts it, of course, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and sometimes they give like a great uh, view of one side of a student that nobody else knows, like at school. And so, yeah. And then the second half, it says, you know, you talk about the counselor letter. Does IA, do they automatically write the counselor's letter? Or do our students have to make an appointment with the counselor? And that's a great question. Um, at IA, uh, and, and really pretty much at most high schools, if a school requires a counselor letter, they write one. That's part of the job of being a counselor. What isn't part of the job of being a teacher is writing a letter of recommendation. So know that the teachers are doing that out of the kindness of their hearts. <laughs> and so. Um, students should be pretty grateful and thankful uh, to teachers for doing that because some write an astounding amount of letters. But when I was here at IA, um, and I just, I just retired uh, last December, but last year I think I wrote 75 letters of recommendation. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I had to retire was carpal tunnel, so. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, just a clarification to your question about the letter. Generally, colleges want from an academic teacher that the students has had, you know, in the high school. But like a letter. yeah, supplementary. Right, a supplemental letter. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. One thing that it does give you the option for on the Common App is for a parent to write a letter. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Johnny's a good boy. Yeah, don't do that. Going along with like outside letters of recommendation, can you put up to two or like a certain number? So you, you've got to look at what the school allows. Some schools will allow like up to six letters. They don't require six, but they'll allow it. Some schools won't allow any. Like if you, if you send Wayne State a letter, they don't look at it at all. It doesn't matter. So you've got to look at the schools and see what they, and then again, right? Think of the admissions people. You want your letters to all say something different about you. If all the letters are saying the same things, then it's annoying. <laughs> so, so just make sure that any extra letter is warranted because it'll show a whole different side of you. Okay, over here. <laughs> um, we all know that IA and every place else is really competitive and they have students and parents put a lot of pressure on to get into the right school. Could you give parents some tips and tricks prevention wise to get ahead of that anxiety and then post once the news comes that they did not get into the school that they want? How can parents like black and white mm -hmm. support their children through that? Well, for one thing, I would never tell my student that they have to get into this school. Uh, you know, it, it, that sounds 
like common sense, but you wouldn't believe how often it happens. Even if, if parents are kind of you know, teasing, but if they're like, listen, we're a U of M family, and so you better get into U of M, you have no idea how much pressure that puts on a young person. I mean, they really feel like their whole, you know, all the love and acceptance and everything is predicated on them getting into a school, and it's something that they, they have very little control over, right? So I would never, ever do that. I would really try to avoid doing that. Um, I would make sure that, uh, you know, you start talking about college and the different options and, you know, exploring that with your student prior to senior year so that you've got some time to really have meaningful conversations um, and also really encourage them to have, like Alicia was talking about, that balanced list. Um, I can't tell you how many, you know, parents are like, well, you can put MSU on there, but you're not going there. Well, well then why are you putting it on there? Um, but also, what if the student doesn't get in anywhere except for this one school? Like, you know, think about the psychological pressure that that's putting on to this, this kid who has all these other things that they're trying to do um, because school is pretty stressful, right? And then, um, and then you're putting parameters on them that they can't possibly have any control over, really. Um, you know, they can do their best on their applications, but then, you know, for a lot of schools, it's almost like winning the lottery if you actually get in because the acceptance rate is so low. So you're really going to want to be super supportive and let them know that, you, you know, you don't care where they get in. You want them to go wherever they want to go, where they would be happy. Another thing to remember is that your student's going to be going to that school, not you, right? So maybe you didn't go to that school or maybe you don't even like that school but it's like a perfect fit for your kid um, and that's where they should go so you know keep that in mind they're the ones that live it then for four years or so so you know one of the ways too is when we start the whole process we start out with the names of the colleges right away you know where do you want to go to uh which school do you want to go to i think if you start the process without the names and just let's talk about college. What is it you want out of those four years? What do you want at the end of those four years? Um, what kind of experience do you want to have? You know, what, what do you want to do with your life? If, if you start having those general conversations and don't talk about a specific college, uh, hopefully your student is going to start looking at it from a different perspective. And then once they have an idea of what it is that they want out of those four years, because you know really when you ask a lot of students, what do you want, what's the answer we get? I don't know. You know, when we try to, Lisa right. tries to work with them on, on those essays and, and trying to get information from them because they're very uh, introspective. Mm -hmm. you know, they haven't had a chance to be introspective. They haven't had a chance to think about what is it that they want. So I think you know, that may help the stress a little bit too. If, if you start out by simply talking about the college experience, what, what do you want, you know, what do you want to do, um, what are your dreams, and then start adding the names. That may help a little bit. And limiting the college list, yes. right? Like a lot of people, it's easy to get caught up in that and kind of start trophy hunting, right? Like, oh, I'm going to apply here because I know I'll get in, and then I can say I got in there. But it isn't worth the amount of time and effort, not to mention money. Every time you apply to a school, it, there's an application fee, $75 or $100. You know, and if you times that by 10, it's getting pretty spendy there. So, um, you know, just being realistic uh, about how many schools they, they could apply to that they would absolutely go to if they got in. So that's another thing. Um, a lot of students end up with schools that they have no intention of ever going to, but their mom or dad wants them to apply there. Well, why? I mean, you know, it's just so much more stress and pressure. So, um, yeah, so starting a little bit early, going on campus visits is really, really, really I can't even tell you how valuable it is. Um, and, uh, and if you go with your student, and then you can really talk about the great things about her, things you didn't like, and what have you, right? So it's really a lot about communication. And making sure, you know, really keep an eye on your student, too, just to make sure that they're not getting overstressed 
overburdened, they want to make you happy, right? So pro they may not even be complaining or whatever, but it, it may end up becoming just too much for them. Um, when is like a good time to start campus visits? Freshman year even, yeah. Like, you know, anytime you're going on vacation and you're driving by a school, stop and take a look. Um, once they get, you know, into like junior year, then you want to be super purposeful about your visits. You want to make sure that you take an official campus tour because then your name gets on the, the college's list. And it also shows something called demonstrated interest, um, which is, you know, a school knows that you're really actually like it, it'll help you in terms of the potential of getting accepted because they know that you're, you're serious enough to have come to visit. Um, but, you know, sometimes you, you find like a lot of people would be like, well, my kid doesn't even seem to care at all about college, right? Well, as soon as you go on a campus visit, that changes because it makes it real. Uh, um, before then, it's just like a, you know, like a weird concept that I don't even know, right? I'm, I'm too focused on high school right now. But actually going, and like I said, any visit's a great visit because even information about what you don't want is extremely valuable. Some schools, obviously, you can't go to if you're looking at a school in Hawaii or whatever, you know, or, or a school that's really far away. They have uh, virtual visits that are actually really good now. They didn't used to be, but after COVID, schools got pretty savvy about that stuff. And so now the virtual visits are pretty great. They have them online that are just taped, and you can watch them any time. And then they have some that happen like in real time that you can sign up for. And that counts as just as much demonstrated interest as being there in person. If I had a choice, though, I would be there in person. And preferably, by the way, on the worst weather possible, because especially like in Michigan, think about it. How many days are going to be perfect and beautiful like in the summer? Like, yeah, right? Hardly any. So if you go to a school and it's raining and it's cold and it's nasty, perfect. Because if you still love that school, <laughs> you know you love it, right? And you also get a much better idea of what it's really like. So that's another thing really quickly. If you can go during the regular school year um, on a day when classes are in session, that's the best. If you can only go in the summer, then go in the summer. That's better than not going. But you have to know that it's going to be, it's going to look and feel different than it normally would during the regular school year. Yeah. I have a microphone. I have a question. Do you have any resources for art schools? Do you have any art school or portfolio resources? Yeah, so um, if you're planning on going to art school or, um, well, art school, I guess, would sometimes, if you're going into architecture too, they would ask for this. Portfolios may be required. So it's all electronic now. So they'll have like a list of the things that they want from you. And then you take pictures of projects or you've got files and then you just send that electronically and the schools that are asking for a portfolio would have the list of things that they're requiring um, it's a little different from things like dance school where they they will likely um, require a, a, a like an audition sometimes they'll let you audition virtually um, you know or send in like a like a you know just like a tape or something not a tape but a um, you know, <laughs> right? I'm yourself. so old. Like you can, you can even, I don't know. You, uh, you record yourself. Um, or um, another thing that you can do is called a Z-E-E-M-E-E. Z -E -E -M -E -E, and it's, it's uh, many schools accept them. And it's like a little movie that you make of yourself and your life and, you know, just to tell them more about you. So that's another potential thing you could do too. Um, if, some school, there's another kind of application called the coalition application. And if you are a very artistic student um, who has, you know, like you, you've got interests in a lot of different areas, like music, dance, uh, art, whatever, the coalition application, if the school um, participates in that, is like an even better way to go because they have a locker that you can put all of these things in. So schools get a more holistic view of you than if you go the common application route. So that would be something to look at too. If I can go back to the college visits for a second. Um, one of the benefits of doing college visits is also that many of the colleges have a why us essay. Oh yes. Okay, and for the students who have not visited, the why us is kind of 
response is a little bland because all they're doing is they're looking at the website and getting information and kind of repeating what they've seen on it. But if they have gone for a visit, that becomes so much more personal in how they respond to why us. Hi, I have two questions. Um, one, I didn't see that interviews at the school made the list. And my husband and I have been doing interviews for our alma mater for about five years. Um, and we didn't think that they mattered, but seeing your list now, I'm wondering if they okay, don't so, matter yeah, at all. Okay, so yeah, she's asking about interviews. If a school offers interviews, um, then for the most part, we recommend that, that you partake in them. Typically, the interviews are done by alumni who live in the area. And they can be virtual, or oftentimes they'll, ha they'll meet you like at a coffee shop or something like that. Um, Typically, the only schools that do interviews are the more highly competitive ones, highly selective schools. And usually, the interview is more or less like, are there any red flags? You know, is this student like who they say they are? Um, and, um, and so it's, kind of, it's not as high pressure as it seems um, if the student just goes and, and they, they are themselves. Typically, it's absolutely fine. Um, and so it's only a negative if somebody shows up and they're like really obnoxious or, <laughs> or it's obvious that the things that they said they did, they can't even really speak about. Um, but um, partaking in the interview is another way to show demonstrated interest. Like if you really want to, to go to a school, you'll do everything that they ask. Like optional doesn't mean optional, okay? Optional means if you don't do this, then we're really not gonna consider you. The only optional question that is really optional is the one, like the COVID question. Like, did something really horrible happen for you or something significant that you, know, that you think that we should know about? Um, if you don't answer that one, it's not counted against you in any way. Other than that, any essay prompt or offer of an interview, um, it's not optional, really. My second question has to do with um, financial aid, and I've heard from a couple different people that their child got into one school and they were offered a package, but they wish that they had a couple other schools with other similar packages that they could then, mm -hmm. and so is that kind of an option if you get into a school? To play Sometimes, but, but it isn't anything to count on, honestly. Uh, what she's asking about is like, can you negotiate, right? Can you say, well, this school offered us this, so can you, if you could do that for us, then our student will, will choose this school. Um, it, back in the day, wouldn't you say, Alicia, that used to be a thing. Right. Now, not so much. Um, the amount of people who apply today is so much greater than it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I mean, it's just, it, it, like, it's so different. It's such a different world now that typically, if you go to a school and you say, look, um, well, one thing I will say, you can always meet with the financial aid office to see if they can do better. And oftentimes they can. It's worth it to mm -hmm. you know, have a phone call or go there and sit down and talk, speak with them. But to you like, try to negotiate it based on other offers that you have from other places, I mean, unless you're, you know, you've already cured cancer, and so <laughs> they would really like you to go to school there, yeah, it's not gonna work. Mm -hmm. A lot of our kids have been uh, a new diagnosis of anxiety because of COVID. So anxiety means like a 504 or an IEP. Mm -hmm. Could you kind of give us a, a 101 on when we should start working with mm -hmm. colleges on mm -hmm. transitioning from IEP at high school mm -hmm. to have IEP mm -hmm. at college? Excellent question. So every public school um, is required by law to provide accommodations if the student comes into uh, the school with a plan that they have in place, a 504 plan um, or an IEP. And so uh, once the student gets accepted, then you can go visit at any time and go to, you know, it's always got a different name, some, I mean, you know, but it's usually, it's some sort of a, a student assistance type center. Um, and then, Basically, you'll have an advocate there who will help to um, uh, create accommodations for the student at the school. It's better to do it before they start 
um, so that when they come in, they'll already have it. And it can be, it can be anything from, you know, we've had uh, clients who actually are housed in particular places because it's just so much more convenient or, you know, accessible. Um, oftentimes students get first pick uh, when it comes to scheduling courses. Um, and then there, are, I mean, there's just, there's a myriad of accommodations. Um, so public schools are, are required by law to do that. Private schools aren't, but they, they do anyway. Um, so uh, it's really just a matter of once the student is accepted, then um, contacting that office, that service office, and um, finding out what their procedure is and how you can help facilitate that prior to the student actually coming in. Just be aware that, you know, different colleges have um, some are much better at that than others. And um, that's something to find out ahead of time. And one of the questions I know people ask is, should I tell up front that my child has a 504 um, or an IEP? And that's really up to you. By law, they cannot discriminate and uh, base their admission on whether your, your child has an IEP or a 504. Um, the other thing, too, is the IEP becomes a 504, in, uh, actually, at the university level. And you have to show documentation and testing and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So make sure that you research all of that prior to saying, yes, this is the college I want my child to apply for. Well, you can actually like contact those those service offices before and just ask what what are their policies like? What do they do? What kind of support services do they offer? And they're not I mean they don't connect it with your student or anything. Um, and there are some schools that are just really known, like Lynn College in Florida or uh, what's another well, one? Adelphi actually in, in New York mm -hmm. as well. But there is a um, a book and I have not looked at it recently, but I think it's called K the letter K and W, but it's specifically for learning disabilities. And so learning disabilities slash special needs. Um, that has a listing of the schools. So it's K and W something. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if you want to email us, I can certainly get you that information too. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got one from Sue. Okay. <laughs> I know a lot of uh, parents were asking like every year if you can kind of go over what should we be doing freshman year what should we be doing sophomore year okay so every year the focus should be on being a student and getting the best grades you can possibly get right freshman year is the year to really look at clubs uh try different things out you know join as many things as you can just to check them out you don't have to stick with it if it's not for you but you're gonna to wanna to find a couple things that uh, really have some meaning for you uh, that hopefully you would stay with then throughout high school. Um, and then sophomore year, that's when uh, typically you're gonna to wanna to do a little bit of thinking about potential career areas, you know, not jobs, because honestly, the jobs that our kids are gonna end up with probably haven't even been invented yet. <laughs> I mean, it's changing so rapidly, right? But Sophomore year is a great time to explore, uh, you know, like where are my areas of interest? What am I, you know, what would be, what are potential uh, ways that I could go? Um, the schools typically have college visits where colleges come here and they do, um, you know, like short, uh, you know, 20 to 30 minute presentations where they just talk about their school. Um, really starting freshman year, freshman year you could go to a couple of them. And I would pick schools you've never heard of before. Um, don't pick the ones that are, you know, like, like you, you know all about them pretty much already. Pick ones like Ringling College. It sounds like it's circus school, but it's not. Um, it is in Florida, and it is the same Ringling family, but it's an amazing school, like amazing for uh, graphic design and for film and for art. It's like fantastic. So, um, you know, go to some, as many of those as you, as you can. I think at IA, freshman year, you're allowed to go to two. Uh, sophomore year, you can go to four, and then junior and senior year, you know, you go to as many as, as you're comfortable with. Sometimes they're right after school, sometimes they're during school and during a class and you can't make it. Um, but you can always arrange for like a one-on-one -on -one with admissions people, um, and a lot of them are virtual now as well. So that's a really great thing to do. Um, it's hard to do service work when you're younger. It's hard to find opportunities. Um, Typically, service work really kind of kicks in by junior year, and that's when you can really get involved in those things. 
Um, another little tip is the more that your student can do that's a little outside of their comfort zone, the better. So, you know, uh, try out things. Like if you hate little kids, <laughs> then, then volunteer at a, at a nursery school or something. You know what I mean? Like really try to push yourself. Um, it makes for great essays later for sure, but also then colleges know that you aren't afraid to go out of your comfort zone. So that is something that they definitely really like to see. Um, so really freshman year and sophomore year is about exploration and then junior year and senior year that's really where you kind of really start to focus. Um, and then of course there's also the test prep which I recommend after uh, sophomore year ends that's when you can start practicing for those tests. And then junior year uh, as many campus visits as you are able to fit in um, definitely. And also you're going to want to meet with your counselor to really have a serious talk about college. I know at International Academy, they have one-on-one -on -one meetings with the parent and the student, um, and you know they just kind of help develop a, a plan going forward for the student. So uh, that's not something that's typically offered at high schools. Um, usually, counselors really don't have time to do that, but um, definitely take advantage of that. Uh, and, uh, and then you can start. Um, kind of doing some exploration and some uh, you know, essay writing stuff towards the end of junior year. And as much as you can get done over the summer before senior year starts, the better, because uh, you'll definitely appreciate it then. I just have a question. Mm -hmm. In the Common App, is there a limit to how many extracurricular activities you can write? Yes, 10. 10. 10. You can list 10 activities and they want you to list them in the order of, of preference for you. So you list your favorite thing first. Um, and then you can list five honors. Uh, and the honors are all academic honors. And some, some colleges will allow you to also turn in a resume. If you have way more stuff and you want to give more information, that's when you would do an additional resume. Mm -hmm. Really quick on the timeline for senior year. What would early admi admission be, mm -hmm. and um, when can you expect to hear back if you did apply, you know, mm -hmm. basically what the timeline is? Sure. So most of the schools in the state of Michigan have what's called rolling admission, which means they start looking at college applications like around the third week in September. And then they'll make offers of acceptance. And then they wait another week or two, and then they do another round. And then they wait another week or two, and they do another. And they just keep doing that throughout the year. So that's rolling admission. So some students, if they're applying to all schools that have rolling admission and they get everything in by like mid-September, they'll know by, before the end of October. They'll already, it'll be done. They'll know where they got accepted. And then you have all this time to think about it. The day that you have to tell schools if you are going to attend or not is May 1st. That is the, 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 the last day. That's like the official day. Um, for colleges that have what's called um, EA, early, uh, um, it's not early. Action. Early action, thank you. Wow, I just had a brain freezer. Um, like U of M does. So their day, it's it, like if you apply, if they receive all of your information by November 1st, they promise you a decision of some sort by a particular date. Every year it varies. Um, it used to be like December 15th-ish, but the last couple of years it's been January. And that decision could also be, we don't know yet, right? So it could be a yes, it could be a no, or it could be a maybe, um, which is called like a deferral. Um, and then they may ask for like your first semester grades from senior year. Um, so typically, EA colleges are, have a November 1st. There are some that have October 15th, but very few. So uh, for the most part, it's November 1. And for November 1 EA, that means that you'll typically get your decision December or January. Um, for regular decision, typically the regular decision date is January 1st or January 15th. And then you really don't get your decisions until March, April. Uh, so it's a little longer of a wait. Um, it's, if a school offers EA and regular decision, it's better to go EA. You have a greater chance of getting in. 
like with, and also with the schools that do rolling admission, earlier is better. But keep in mind that nobody looks at anything until like the third week of September, okay? So you've got, you've got some time there. Like putting stuff in in, um, in August does you no good. Nobody's looking at it. It's actually a longer time where it could likely get lost. So it's better to do it like mid-September. The other kind of decision is uh, ED, early decision. That's different in that it's a binding contract. So if your student wants to go ED uh, to a school, then you sign this contract, your student signs it, and the counselor signs it too. So it's stating that everybody understands that with an early decision contract, you can only apply to one place, ED, because you are guaranteeing that if you're accepted, you're gonna go there. It's binding. And you're also saying that regardless of how much it costs, you're gonna go there, because you don't know what the financial package is gonna be if they're gonna offer you anything. So you have to be prepared to pay full price. Um, Typically, your, the potential that you'll be accepted through early decision is higher than through early action or regular decision because you're a known quantity, right? You're guaranteeing that you're gonna get in. And this actually all goes back to rankings. It's a rankings game. The way that the rankings go up is the schools that offer the least amount of offers of admission and have the highest percentage of those offers accepted, that's what makes the rankings go up. So that's why ED is really attractive for schools because if you, if, if, you're a, if you apply ED and you're accepted, you're coming, right? No matter what. And it's really hard to get out of that. Like it's like, like you're not gonna get out of it really easily for sure. Um, so don't do that unless you know for a fact that, that that's the way you wanna go. And then with ED, um, typically it's a November 1 deadline and you'll find out by mid-December. So you talked about for college admissions how there's academic honors. What are some examples of those? Because I'm a junior and I'm interested in that. Um, so an academic honor could be like a scholar athlete award. It could be if your school recognizes cum laude for junior year, summa cum laude or uh, magna or cum, that's based on your grade point average. It could be a book award. Um, at the, I know at International Academy, at the end of junior year, the junior teachers and the counseling department, they get, they get books from various colleges, like, uh, I'm trying to remember who does a book award. Wellesley does a book award, um, Chatham does one, uh, um, uh, Mount Holyoke does one. Anyway, these books, uh, you know, they're looking for a student who maybe, um, uh, you know, is really active in social justice or something like that. So that would be if you were awarded a book award or a departmental award at the end of junior year, they're departmental awards. So the science department gives out an award to one or two students and the math department does, et cetera. They, there are department awards again your senior year, but the junior year ones you can put on your application. Um, Actually also like being invited to apply for or, or getting into National Honor Society, you can list that as an honor. So that's another one or any other honor society. Yeah, thank you for, for all of this. Um, I'm super new to this. So when you said that there is activities that we can list um, and there's two that are, you know, specific to longevity and, you know, the passion of the student, how important is it like, uh, Prior, like those would be the priority, the first two are the most important ones, like and then like three, four, five are like the less, okay, so those two are the most important and then? Well, it depends on the student. So some activities, like an activity could be a paid job. Like a lot of students have to work, right? And that is like colleges totally respect that. Or even taking care of a sibling. Or, um, I mean, there, there are family expectations and things. That can be listed as well. And what if there was like a whole bunch of volunteer activities and services? Right. So like, mm -hmm. which would be more important to list first, I guess, like the most? Mm -hmm. Whichever one is the most important to the student. There's no way to do that wrong. Um, that's why they don't say like list it chronologically or whatever. It's really just whatever order you want to put it in. How it's meaningful for, for colleges is they'll be like, well, so the first thing that they list is like their 
their number, like, like the thing that they're involved in the most or you know, that, that takes the majority of their time or that means the most to them. Yeah, but it's kind of a minor thing. Hi, you had mentioned in your timeline about doing essays potentially the summer before. Mm -hmm. So that implies that the questions don't change that much from year to year. Could you expand on that a little? Absolutely. Bit? So the common application has one essay that everybody has to write. Um, and they, they have six or seven, they, well, there are seven prompts every year. Typically, those don't change. Um, the last change was a couple years ago, and um, they changed a you know, like a question that was really more about, I think it was about solving a problem. Is there a problem you want to solve and how would you solve it? They changed it to um, uh, what is something that someone, a gift that someone gave you that you didn't appreciate at the time but now you really appreciate. Um, but that's like the, the only change that's been in I don't know how many years. So. Typically, you can just look at the Common App essay prompts and you can practice on any of those. Um, the supplemental questions, like the individual questions for different colleges, um, sometimes they change a lot, like for University of Chicago, the one that has really weird questions like define X or, you know, where's Waldo? Um, their questions change dramatically. Most schools, though, doesn't change much. Typically, schools will have a question that's a why us, like what Alicia mentioned. It's kind of like a, you know, why is our school so attractive to you? What is it about our school that's so perfect for you? And what is it about you that's so perfect for us, right? Most schools have a why us, a version of the why us. Um, mo many schools have a community essay. They want to know about any community, like the community that you're in that's, that means the most to you, which could be, Anything from, you know, like your religious organization to maybe you're in a community of people who are obsessed with cooking the perfect steak. Like, you know, it's just like you and other people who really speak a language that you just, you have this great understanding of. So typically a community question. A lot of schools have a question about diversity. There are like, um, you know, kind of categories of the different essays. And if you look at the college essay guy, he's actually got them all listed. Um, that absolutely you can practice with prior to. So but the actual, like, I'm sorry, um, on August 1st, that's when the common application rolls over. And then they have all the new supplements. Five more minutes, OK. Then you have all the new supplements from all the colleges, and that's when you'll see what the, the essay prompts are for that year. So your student can actually make a common application account now. And then every year it rolls over. The thing that doesn't roll over is anything in supplements. So, but you could do the common portion of it. So, Lisa, um, coming from the IA, um, we are trying to expose the kids to more internship and shadowing opportunities right now. Mm -hmm. Is that paying off in, in essays when you kind of? What I heard, and I'm very unexperienced as a German mom who never studied in the mm -hmm. U.S. Um, is that making really a difference to kind of present well-rounded um, kids or students who had been exposed to different kind of things and mm -hmm. channeled kind of down mm -hmm. to the things that they are really most interested in? Does it help to mm -hmm. expose them or is it okay. kind of nice to have? Excellent question. Um, remember, they're not expecting your student to be well-rounded. Right? It's almost like they want a bunch of pointy-headed people <laughs> because then when you put them all together, it makes a well-rounded student population. Okay? Um, internships, job shadowing, is, it's great for students who have a particular interest. Let's say like um, my interest is in the medical field. Well, then I would encourage that student to job shadow, intern, uh, interview as many different kinds of doctors or, or nurses or anybody in that, in that field as possible because then they'll have a, like a wealth of experience to, to write about, right? A lot of it is finding out what you don't want to do. Um, if you have a particular interest in engineering, that's another one where it's really great to, you know, like um, if you can job shadow, and job shadowing is like a day. It, it's not like, you know, for weeks or anything, right? But different kinds of engineers um, to see where your interests might lie. Um, is it essential for uh, college admittance? No, it's not. 
but it can be really super valuable experience for the student. And if they are looking for a very particular field or area, it's helpful then. Okay, I think we're getting close to our time, so if I'm not mistaken, thank you for inviting us. Thank I hope you, you found yes. our information mm -hmm. helpful, and thank you for your time. Good night. Good night.